Welcome to Community Connections, brought to you by Synapsity, featuring conversations, stories, and interviews with Ottawa's leading change makers. Enjoy this episode. Welcome in to a brand new episode of Community Connections, brought to you by Synapsity. Today we speak with Carolyn McKenzie, who's working with Walkable Ottawa and the Glebe Community Association to make Ottawa a better place. All right, welcome everybody to today's Community Connections podcast brought to you by Synapsity. And I'm really excited today to welcome community builder extraordinaire, Carolyn McKenzie. And Carolyn has a business background and was a founding partner in the Ottawa-based CPCS. She spent much of her professional time consulting uh, and was responsible for large-scale infrastructure projects. And she took on a senior leadership role at Canada's largest project management firm, Collier's Project Leaders. Carolyn is also a passionate community advocate, and that's how we at Synapsity got to know her. She's involved in planning and walkability issues. She's played leadership roles in various capacities across the community, where she's engaged in activities related to policy studies and has led various efforts aimed at informing and awareness raising, things we love at Synapsity. Carolyn recognizes the important intersect of planning, intensification, walkability, and climate issues. She joined Walkable Ottawa in 2020 and has played a leadership role working collaboratively with industry, community members, environmental organizations, and housing advocates to advance walkability in urban neighborhoods, something I just love. She has prioritized the development tools and approaches to develop practical solutions to those challenges poised in transitioning neighborhoods to greater walkability. And lately, Carolyn has been at the forefront for the fight of a better Lansdowne 2.0. So welcome in, Carolyn, to our podcast. Great. Thanks very much, Nick. And thanks for that uh, that very uh, nice uh, introduction. And uh, yeah, great to be here. Great to be part of this conversation. Yeah, so we're going to talk about community development, uh, your role at Walkable Ottawa, and of course, Lansdowne 2.0. But first, I'm curious to learn a little bit more about your backstory. Uh, You started out in consulting, and you've worked more and more in community development throughout your career. So what what kind of drew you into working a little bit more in community development? Yeah, that's interesting. So I grew up, I'm actually from Kingston. I'm not from Ottawa originally. I grew up in Kingston, Ontario. And my mom actually was a city councillor and deputy mayor in Kingston when I was uh, younger, growing up in public school and high school. Um, and after politics, she remained you know, very involved in community work. She chaired the United Way campaign, and Community Foundation. She was actually chair of the Police Services Board uh, for a while as well, kind of a variety uh, of things, but, um, but improving the community and trying to work with community was always really at the heart of it. Um, so that was, she was certainly, I think a a big, a big influence. It's a bit, maybe perhaps a bit in my DNA to be interested in community development. Um, my dad actually was also a prof um, at Queens, uh, Queens has a master's in urban planning program or former, um, uh, head of planning uh, for the city of Ottawa, Stephen Willis, uh, was actually a graduate of that program. So I'm sure that that was a bit of an influence as well. Lots of, uh, you know, supper time conversations about community and urban planning and uh, all those kind of things. So that was, I think those were big influences uh, for me, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah, it runs in the family. I have the same sort of thing. Uh, you know, my mom's uh, really into community building and uh, works with Carleton and uh, has run for political office, yeah. too. So uh, absolutely understand that it, uh, it kind of wraps itself in the DNA. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I'm wondering with your consulting experience, what skills were you able to kind of carry over into the community building? Yeah, so I guess um, when you think about, I mean, consulting, when people say they're consultants, like, what the heck does that mean? Um, but I think consulting for me um, was all about, and I, I was with a firm, we did infrastructure planning uh, consulting, so big transportation systems, power systems, uh, mostly some in Canada, but mostly overseas, actually. Um, but consulting for me it was all about uh, really getting a good handle on the problem that you're trying to solve or resolve, identifying issues. Um, certainly accessing the right resources to help you develop potential solutions. Uh, and then working, of course, with interested parties or stakeholders uh, towards a solution. 
um, obviously a very strong need for project management skills to keep all the pieces moving along and on time, on budget and all those things as well. Um, so, and I guess in my work, I led um, really multi, I have a business background, but I led um, and was involved in multidisciplinary teams of experts, you know, engineers, uh, finance types, uh, lawyers, et cetera, to try and develop those solutions, mostly to more sort of business related issues or problems. Um, but, uh, but, and I guess there, I, I look at that and I think, well, community building is also really multidisciplinary in nature. It's about, it's about how we live, um, which is impacted by so many factors, you know, housing for sure. We all have to live in our community somewhere. Uh, although for many people are obviously struggling very hard on that, on that point, uh, right now. Um, but also things like obviously transportation, uh, amenities, recreation, uh, municipal finance, a uh, really important part of uh, how, how all these, uh, what sort of investments we need in our communities, trees and green space, um, and increasingly a lot of talk about uh, community and the focus on climate resiliency, that's another issue. So so I think there's there's a lot of my background which lends itself um, to getting involved and hopefully being somewhat effective in community development and, and making, making, uh, making some contributions there. It's that multidisciplinary um sort of uh background there um and i guess maybe the other thing was that uh, you know as i said i i worked um overseas in different cultures different lots of different countries in middle east and africa as well as here in canada um and it was important to be able to try and really clearly communicate you know your objectives project objectives communicate analysis that you were developing um, but also to listen to project stakeholders who were operating, obviously in many cases of context, very different from my own, very different from my, my own background, my own environment. Um, and I think to work with people effectively, it was it was important to develop and understand that you really need to, to check your assumptions um, and try to be open-minded about what others bring to the table and what values are driving, you know, concerns, potential solutions that, that may they may think are are best, and those are. I think those are all sort of uh, important, important aspects, uh, and that again, sort of hopefully, help me make a, bit, a reasonable contribution to uh, to the conversation of community building. Absolutely, you know, those are some great skills, and like you said, very important to to have the multidisciplinary kind of look at things because the you know community building sort of touches so many different areas and I know that you have extensive volunteer experience as well and you served as a member of the FCA and on the Glebe Community Association wondering what draws you to volunteer work yeah well I guess you know again I, I think it's uh, maybe a little bit of the in the in the DNA that was it was just it was a it was a I think it was a strong value of my own family and and I think also the you know, of the, of the community that I, that I live in. A lot of people, a lot of busy, you know, people with busy lives, um, but they're very interested in, in giving back to their community. So, um, yeah, I'm certainly not the only one who spends a fair bit of time on in volunteer efforts. Uh, I, I remember a few years ago, I was working on a on an issue in the community uh, and I was at, I was sort of chairing a meeting um, you know, it was a bit. It was a bit of a difficult conversation that we were having with some residents and on a development issue. Uh, and then I ran into a fellow a couple of days later, um, at a, you know, out, a, out in the community, and was chatting. And he said, "Geez, it's really interesting. That's that's quite the hobby that you have. Quite an interesting hobby." <laughs> and I thought, "Oh, I didn't really. I've never really thought of uh, <laughs> this volunteer work as a as a hobby per se, but." you know maybe 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 he maybe he's right um i find it challenging uh definitely particularly all the there is a there's there's a certain element of sort of trying to you know herd the cats or um just bringing people together again that sort of trying to trying to figure out what what is really what's the why behind a concern uh that people may be raising in the community and trying to get behind what those concerns are to really um to, trying to get at better solutions I find it challenging. Um, I, I find it obviously meaningful. If I if I didn't, uh, I wouldn't be doing it. Um, and at the end of the day, while there are lots of frustrations uh, along the way, um, I I like to uh, to tell myself, or I, I like to think that even you know the small wins uh, are are important uh, and important to community building. So just making incremental uh, progress uh, along the way, I think is uh, I think is important. I saw. I was looking recently at a at a Banksy um, uh, artwork, a piece of artwork, and it was an image of a, a young girl, 
sort of sitting, well, obviously looking very tired. And it said when you, um, it talked about when you, you know, when you're tired, uh, rest, don't quit. Um, and I thought, oh, that's, that's kind of, <laughs> so I, sometimes I, I have to kind of keep that in mind when it comes to, because it's, it's not always easy. Um, and it, some people say, oh, Carolyn, why do you, you know, why do you do this? Um, when, when the more frustrating, uh, you know, it's times it can be frustrating, but it's, you know, so I try to, uh, remind myself of, you know, just take a little rest, get a bit of perspective, come back to it and try and work positively for, for some positive change. Absolutely. You know, what a great hobby. And, and we hope more and more people kind of take that hobby up and uh, volunteer in their community and uh, give back a little bit more. And uh, yeah, absolutely agree with you about having those rest periods and uh, yeah. coming back rejuvenated. So let's talk a little bit about Walkable Ottawa. Uh, Walkable Ottawa brings together community members, planners, advocates and builders. Uh, to uh, have a detailed consultation and collaboration. Um, so tell us a little bit about this initiative and uh, and some of the collaborations that you've been able to uh, partake in. Yeah, thanks. Um, so really happy to talk about Walkable Ottawa. It's uh, something, as I said, uh, I've been involved in for a few years now, I guess since probably going back to about May 2020. Um, May 2020 was a time uh, uh, when the city was moving forward uh, its growth management plan. And many people will recall that was uh, in May, there was this marathon three-day um, planning committee, joint planning committee, um, an agriculture committee session. I think about 100 people showed up uh, to have their five minutes say about the urban boundary, whether we should, which of the three options that the city were considering should we should we should follow we should adopt and there was the expand the urban boundary there was the no expansion and then there was the the middle the middle option so to speak um anyway so i i spoke on behalf of the um the Glee community association at, at the time um and uh and rosalind hill uh was an architect uh, very well i think she's a very well known architect does lots of important infill uh, development uh, design work uh, in Ottawa. She spoke um, uh, sort of similar timing to me during one of the days, uh, and um, and she called me up not too long after that um, because I think she she heard I, I presume something in what I had to say. Uh, she I think she saw something of someone a so-called community type, uh, and she was looking for community types to to work with her as she. As she founded Walkable Ottawa, um, and not just community type, she her her idea really with Walkable Ottawa, as you as you said in sort of the, your your introduction, was to was to combine uh, community uh, so called community types, residents, and uh, people interested in 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 their own communities, but community development across the city perhaps as well, with uh, so called industry types, so developers. Uh, architects like yourselves, uh, planners perhaps as well, uh, and just trying to have better collaborative uh, conversations about planning and development uh, issues, particularly as they impacted on a more walkable city, or walkable neighborhoods within within the city. Um, and I think, again, that was, that was sort of a reflection of, um, of many of the conversations that happen around community development and planning and development issues in the city. I think Ros and I share a view that many of those conversations are tend to be quite stovepiped. So for instance, like the city may have a conversation with a bunch of residents group or community association or a few community associations and get feedback. And then they may uh, meet with say the GOBA, the Greater Ottawa Home Builders Association have conversations with there, but they're not that many um, opportunities or, or uh, opportunities I'll say for those parties to come together um, in more than a fairly superficial way and and have discussions around policy. I mean, we'll come together on a, on a, on a when there's a particular development application, but that that's a, that's that can be a timing where there's when there's um, uh, some conflict and it's hard to have, which makes a conversation about uh, policy issues more difficult when you're under time pressure. Uh, in, in terms of a development application, and there's conflict around because people are very concerned about exactly how this is going to unfold for them in their community. 
So the idea with Walkable Ottawa was really to, to, to move that away uh, and to think about policy and to try and have conversations and bring bring those parties together to really, again, try to try to check our assumptions, hopefully check any baggage that we have as well, <laughs> based on our own viewpoints, um, and uh, and really try to get at the whatever concerns as community members we have, or concerns that res that sorry that industry people have, try to get a better understanding of what's behind those concerns so that we can try and get a better solutions and find that common ground so that was really the the impetus behind uh walkable ottawa and a little bit different um i mean obviously we're focused on developing policies for 15 minute neighborhoods but but it's a but there was a real intent to try and bring together parties that just don't have as much of an opportunity to to have conver good conversations yeah, what an important initiative. You know, it seems to me if you're not uh, careful in your planning, then you really become an unwalkable city. You know, I'm thinking yeah. a, about a place like Toronto, not to throw too much shade, but it's very difficult to obviously walk across and certain areas where you can't access. And I know uh, Walkable Ottawa has done a lot of work around Ottawa's official plan. And you've advocated for transitional sidewalks. Uh, transitional parking, more walkable destinations, more local vendors, and a whole lot more. So how are you feeling about Ottawa's new official plan, and was it able to encompass some of these things? Yeah, um, I think the new official plan, uh, certainly a lot of good, um, uh, good high-level uh, policy, a lot of good intent stated. Um, there's definitely showing a strong uh, direction towards uh, supporting um, and nurturing walkable neighborhoods, uh, but there there are a, a few, um, and, and I feel like we did have a fair bit of influence. I would I would like to think that some of what you see in the official plan is is um, uh, comes from some of what you know what we had to say and some of the options that we were proposing be considered. Um, but there are still uh, there's still a lot of work to be done um, because I I think that. Uh, and I'll, I'll give, well, the city has just launched um, its comprehensive zoning bylaw, um, and and that will for the whole city. It's it's a complete uh, well, not just an update. It's it's a complete revamp of the zoning bylaw, which will uh, have implications for our built form, um, our density, our our land use uh, within within communities. Uh, so and we're we're working. With the city, um, I'm part of a working group with the city uh, focused on on providing early stage, very just early stage input, and the city will will be rolling out consultations on that. Um, so I think that's that's really important, um, and and that's important because of the role that density plays in walkable neighborhoods. Um, there is a certain uh, I would say I'll call it a threshold. Uh, of density that is that you really need within a community in order to say have a coffee shop or a grocery store uh, be at all interested in setting up in your neighborhood um, and whether it's whether you live, happen to live in a neighborhood next to like a full-size Loblaws or or a small grocer uh, is dependent on the density uh, of your the catchment area for for your neighborhood and and no different obviously for a coffee shop or a small hardware store and those are those are important things to be able to access by foot by bicycle um, however um, however you can access it without actually having to get into your car so that density piece and it is directly related to the zoning bylaw um, will have a huge impact on 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 advancing i guess the 15-minute neighborhood uh, concept uh, so that's one thing um but we'd like to talk about um like an ecosystem uh of walkability factors so there's a density piece which i just spoke to very touched on very briefly um but they're also and they're also the, the amenities whether they are things like coffee shops and commercial things destinations also recreation facilities uh, schools uh public infrastructure um, and then uh, there, there are also things that make you actually want to walk. So if I have a 15 minute walk to get to the grocery store, but I'm walking, um, but I ha in the summertime when it's really hot, I have to walk 15 minutes in the blazing sun. 
I might just opt to get in my car and do that walk rather than doing that. So, so trees are really important. If I'm walking down a street that has, um, it's a super busy street and it has lots of uh, surface parking lots and cars are coming in and out of as I'm walking down the street, you know, maybe I don't want my 10 year old kid uh, who I would otherwise say, yeah, you know, you can walk down the street to, to get to your friend's house. Perhaps I'm, I'm not going to suggest that I, I won't. I'm not going to be that happy with with a you know a, a child of that age to to doing that walk or even that bike to get to their friends' house. Maybe I'm going to say, "Hey, I'll drive you," uh, which uh, you know is not is is kind of kind of going in the wrong direction. So there are things that will make a walk um, delightful, attractive. Um, having main streets, uh, if you have a main, if you're lucky enough to have a bit of a main street, uh, a high street in in your neighborhood. Uh, making sure that those uh, that those that along the street there are attractive storefronts to just to keep you interested and to make that walk not feel like 15 minutes but perhaps feel like five minutes or, or a lot less. A, a boring, unattractive, certainly an unsafe walk is going to feel a lot longer than a walk where you're looking at I don't know nice trees or nice greenery along the way, interesting storefronts. You know that's that sort of thing. It, it'll be much shorter. And you're much more likely to do it. So attractive and delightful walks are also very important. Yeah, absolutely. And having neighborhoods with sidewalks, uh, I know that's a yep. big thing in, in a lot of neighborhoods. I'm over in Carlington. A lot of folks in Alta mm. Vista don't. Um, and I just wanted to shout out some of the work that you've got on your website. We'll put a link in the show notes, but there's some great videos over there um, talking a little bit about some of the work that you've done around the official plan. So I invite folks to check those out because, uh, you know, they really sort of lay out some of the some of the great uh, work and that you've advocated for. So let's talk a little bit about uh, home prices and rent prices. That's something that's a huge topic. It's not going away. You mentioned a little bit about the density issue. Um, I'm wondering, what are some of the solutions that Walkable Ottawa is advocating for to combat the trend of, of higher home prices and higher rent prices that's really hitting the market right now? Yeah, so um, so one of the, and again, this does, uh, there's a strong relationship with, again, the, the zoning bylaw and what the city is looking to, to try and do uh, to allow for um, more units, more more density, um, but hopefully to do it in a way that will um, not detract from our neighborhoods, not detract from our sense of community, um, but to do it in a way that will fit in fit in well uh, with, with the existing uh, community. Or, um, and and a and I guess a, a transitioning uh, uh, you know a future vision for what the community should should uh, should look like in order to accommodate uh, you know more more residents. Um, so I guess I, I think the the main thing there and it's something that the city has been talking about is form based zoning. So um, to just sort of simplify it, uh, in the past the zoning. Uh, would set out all sorts of rules about um, the, uh, the, you know, how, what sort of built form, what sort of structure house you could build, and whether it was a, you know, a single, a uh, single family unit versus a tri duplex or a triplex or a fourplex, how many units could be in, um, and so there were very lots of very strict uh, constraints around that. Um, but going forward, the city is is uh, is. It will be looking through this revamp of the zoning bylaw at more of a form-based approach. So to regulate the box, uh, so to speak, uh, the size of the box, the setbacks uh, from the property line of the box, so how close it can get to the uh, to the property line um, on you know on all sides, how how tall that box can be, um, other other aspects of what the box should include and what it shouldn't include, um, but not so much what happens inside inside the box um, and that's uh, I, I, I that's not uh, uh, that's a very simplified <laughs> description uh, I guess of what form based zoning is um, but it but but really moving away uh, from the idea that um, that you can't have a duplex or a triplex um, in in a space that's currently being occupied uh, by single family home. Um, and recent, I guess, recent legislation, I mean, the city is moving in that direction, I believe, but uh, recent legislation uh, through the provincial government has certainly uh, pushed us well forward into that by, by essentially removing 
uh, the ability of cities to restrict uh, what we what we formerly knew as R1 zoning to a single one one property one house. Um, cities will not be able. They can still put in regulations about how much uh, how big the footprint can be, the height of the the height of that structure. Uh, but we're now uh, in an environment where you can't tell someone that they they can't have a can't have a duplex uh, on 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 that property. So that in itself uh, should help us add to supply. Uh, but there's a lot more there's a lot more work a uh, lot more work to be done. Yeah, absolutely. It seems like smart densification is kind of the way to go. And I know Walkable Ottawa has really been advocating and doing a lot of work to make sure we get that smart development. And I think that kind of segues over to our next conversation really well. So let's talk a little bit about Lansdowne 2.0. And we know that there's plans that, uh, you know, for 40 foot towers and things that probably won't really fit in with the neighborhood that's there yet now. But you've been working with the Glebe Community Association to support a different vision of Lansdowne down 2.0. Um, tell us a little bit about more more about this vision and, and how it's different from uh, OSEG's vision that they're putting forward to the city. Yeah, um, great, uh, great question. And uh, when it comes to Lansdowne, <laughs> Lansdowne is, has always been complicated. Um, well, I guess uh, I, I, Lansdowne, I'll call it Lansdowne 1.0 um, of uh, 2010. I guess that was a 2010-ish uh, sort of discussion. Um, it's been it's been like it is a complicated deal. It is a, a public-private partnership between the city and the Ottawa Sports and Entertainment Group, that are known as OSEG. Um, it's a complicated deal. Um, it's a it's a deal that uh, that residents and taxpayers uh, don't have uh, access to for the most part. The details of that of that deal. Um, it was uh, a deal that was uh, that was proposed by OSEG, um, and not too many years after, I think 2014 was really the the launch of operations at Lansdowne, um, and not too long after that, in fact, uh, OSEG was reporting to the city that the funds that were expected to uh, to flow to the city through this waterfall, which is just a, a different name for the distribution of cash that that uh, Lansdowne uh, was expected to generate it was actually not, in fact, going to generate any anything for the city, um, but also uh, that OSEG itself, uh, the partnership, I should say, was was losing money on an operating basis, and and OSEG, uh, and that's been the case actually every year since since Lansdowne began. Uh, so that's that's clearly a problem. It's a big problem for OSEG, who are, have responsibility for for financing those losses. Um, so it's a problem that needs to be fixed. Something needs to be done. That's clear. Um, but I, what I think, uh, I think the community is really struggling on a couple of fronts. Uh, first, and I, I think first and foremost, and and before we start talking about the specifics of the the towers that are proposed, the arena that's proposed to go into the Great Lawn area, those sort of things. I think what we're really struggling with is the lack of consultation on those key elements. Uh, uh, that are that are being proposed. Uh, there have been lots of consultations for the last uh, what three, four, five months, uh, but the consultations are really dealing with sort of um, uh, with smaller important items, but smaller items around improvements to the public realm. But there really has not been any consultation about the the key items about the the north side stands, the arena, and its play and its relocation to the Great Lawn. Uh, there'll be a, there's a rezoning process that's kicking off now, uh, which will which will look for approval of, of those towers, and and that's going forward as well. Um, those are all those are all, but 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 stepping back, what we understood, and certainly what residents, uh, many residents across the city understood from when this went to council a year ago, uh, over a year ago now, was that we would be uh, there would be robust consultations on these elements, and there just haven't been. Um, uh, notwithstanding what OSEG and the city have to say, uh, I, I think there's a fair bit of consensus that that's that's just not the case. Uh, but and then the and then the overlay to, on top of that, uh, and I, I really should have started with with this part, is the lack of transparency with respect to the financials. Uh, we and actually it's not just residents and taxpayers, but uh, uh, councillors, the mayor and councillors. I don't believe have access to the financials 
and uh, there's a serious lack of transparency around what has been presented to councillors to date um, that that is going to lead, in my view, can only lead to an uninformed uh, decision when this is, uh, I'll say, pushed through in, in October uh, at, at Finance Committee and Council, assuming that we're still still on that on that timeline. Um, uh, we've been asking for financial transparency, and it just hasn't uh, it hasn't happened. Uh, and it's not just us. There was a you may be aware of a, a letter that was uh, that was submitted and uh, to the mayor uh, back at the end of June. Kevin Page, Penny Colinet, Paul Champ, Joanne Kinello, Michael Wernick, you know, people with very strong credentials in governance, um, you know, financial transparency issues. Uh, and they had a fair bit to say uh, about what they thought was important in terms of that transparency. And without it, I don't believe we can have an informed uh, discussion or I don't believe council can have an informed discussion and I don't think an informed decision uh, can, can be made. So that's that's really disappointing. And it's and it's but it's much more than disappointing. It's um, it's a huge concern because it is the second largest project after the LRT. Uh, they'll have updated cost estimates for Lansdowne, but it's likely going to be in the neighborhood of close to the 400 million uh, of taxpayers' uh, money, a lot of, of hundreds of millions of dollars of debt that we'll be taking on. We saw some very rosy projections about what the um, the profits that the Red Blacks are going to kick out in the future, the profits that the retail leasing business for OSEG that's run by Trinity that's going to kick out in the future. Uh, as well as uh, a very heavy reliance on property taxes to 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 pay down all this debt. If it doesn't happen, taxpayers will be be footing the bill for this, and that's a problem because as we to bring it back to walkability in general across the city, that's a problem because uh, that if those if those projections do not come true and we can't service that debt. Taxpayers' money will have to go into servicing that debt, and that's money that could have gone into transit, to building sidewalks, to making our walks more interesting, to planting trees on roadways, to doing all the things that we need to do to support walkable, uh, walkable neighborhoods. Um, so that's that's uh, so. I think I think the uh, amongst the community uh, there is a different vision of. of uh, something that would certainly, yes, fit within the, the neighborhood a little bit better. I think there's an, uh, certainly a, a support for adding residential, uh, but that kind of density, uh, towers that they're talking about and the density that they're proposing, uh, belong on the LRT or rapid transit, and Lansdowne doesn't have either of those things. So we're just, we already have well-recognized transportation issues and Recently, we've had a lot of discussion in the media about the Queen Elizabeth Driveway and, and traffic issues there. We're about to make uh, an investment and add a whole bunch of development that will just add to those to those transportation woes. And and at the end of the day, make our neighborhood uh, less walkable in, in the process. Yeah, no, those are some great points. Uh, you know, I think you really ran down uh, some of the issues with Lansdowne, especially around the financials, the transparency, the engagement, which is obviously something that uh, we support at Synapsity. Um, and I know that uh, your group has uh, modeled what that might look like with the 40-foot towers in the arena. And you've also created a vision, uh, an alternative vision of what it might look like with a, a recreational center. And you've been able to display this at community events at Lansdowne and around the community. Community. So tell tell us a little bit about um, the modeling and and the reaction that you've gotten to it through by, through the community. Yeah, that's um, great. So uh, I mean, speaking of volunteers, uh, Richard Corbet, who happens to live in the Glebe um, and it has great skills in building models. Uh, if you if you've seen the images, and I think you're going to pop, pop up the images at some point, so others can see them too. Um, he actually built the scale model uh, of of the Lansdowne 2.0 proposal, and as you say, we took the model, then we took it to the farmers market on a couple of uh, a couple of uh, weekends. Um, we took it to 613 Flea as well, uh, and really because those, both of those are very, um, uh, you know, very popular activities at Lansdowne. Those are some of the real success uh, successes that can be pointed to, and in addition to some great events, and, uh, and I'll give OSEG full marks for putting on some great events uh, that people really enjoy at Lansdowne. Um, but anyway, we took the model there. 
and really our purpose uh, was that we, you know, again, uh, in terms of consultation and engagement, we didn't think that what the city was putting out uh, to residents was an accurate portrayal of what the proposal might ultimately look like. And not to say that a scale model is going to capture exactly what it could look like, um, but but in terms of the the overall, you know, the the, the just the, the scale of the massing. Um, I don't like to get too caught up actually in the height uh, of towers per se, but it is about the, the massing of those towers and how they would impact on the rest of the site uh, that was important to, con to convey um, how it would impact on, there's a, there are three towers involved, 40 stories, 34 stories, and I think it's 29 stories. And uh, one of the towers, very close proximity to the Aberdeen Pavilion, which is the iconic, um, you know, really unique uh, building uh, that 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 sets mm -hmm. Lansdowne that 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 is part of the unique characteristic, I guess, of, of Lansdowne, uh, and it's a special part of Lansdowne. And to have a have those three buildings really dominating that uh, that building, really dominating the public space, the plazas, the Aberdeen uh, uh, plaza out front. Uh, we felt that it was important to uh, to give people an idea. Uh, and the reaction, it was very interesting. A lot of people, uh, you know, came out, it, it, you know, having a strong visual like that to look at. People were intrigued. They thought, oh, wow, well, you know, what's this all about? Are, are you proposing this? I said, no, no, this is, we're not, I'm with the, I would say I'm with the Glebe Community Association. We are just trying to raise some awareness. Did you, are you aware of the proposal? Um, what do you, what do you think? Uh, and to get people's reaction. And they said, well, you know, we heard that there was going to be some residential added, but we had no idea. That it was that this is what they were talking about, like these three skyscrapers. People had no idea. Um, they also had no idea that uh, the arena that was being proposed was not going to be built uh, again where it is where it is today, but rather they were going to build it in where the tobogganing hills and into the Great Lawn. Um, if you happen to have picked up uh, a copy of the Lansdowne Two Point proposal that the city and OSEG were circulating around, it uses language that kind of implies that that arena will just, they'll put grass on top of it and they'll just tuck it in under the existing berm, which again is that the tobogganing hill. Um, but that's, in my view, it's very disingenuous as to the amount of space that that arena will actually occupy, about two and a half stories out of the ground, although part of it is sunken, it'll still come up two and a half stories out of the ground. Um, I, you know, for anyone who's been there for a festival, it'll be taking up a lot of that space. Like a music festival will suddenly have, you'll have, I'm going to say roughly two thirds of, of the, of the space there. So, uh, and at the same time, they're talking about proposing to add upwards of 2,500 residents to the site. Residents who will be living in what will be fairly small units and they're going to need outdoor space. Uh, just you know, just those those new residents coming into those buildings if they get approved. Not to mention all the all the additional residents that we expect to join the neighborhood as we continue to intensify. So the loss of green space is a, that's a huge, huge, uh, huge, huge concern. Um, uh, so yeah, yeah, go ahead. Absolutely, you know, and I think your model really conveys that. Things like loss of sunlight, wind tunnels is something that I think about a lot and, and being yeah. able to enjoy the space and be able to walk around there and encourage people to walk rather than take yeah. their cars and bikes. So some, some great work there. Uh, so next up, we know that it's going to be a crucial fall for the proposal. It'll go through council. And uh, I'm wondering, um, can you take us through um, what to expect in this process and maybe some of the important dates? And also, uh, just a few words for folks who may want to get involved in the fight for a better event, Lansdowne. Yeah. Um, so the important dates coming up are now, it now it looks like, I don't think it's on actually in the calendar, although it, I haven't checked the calendar, the City of Ottawa calendar lately for committees, but I think it's going to the Finance Committee on October 18th, followed by uh, Council. Um, now, um, you can't actually speak at a Council meeting, but you certainly can register. You have to register in advance. Uh, to speak at uh, committee and everyone uh, is uh, allowed their five minutes to speak uh, at committee to whatever issue and, and this uh, the Lansdowne issue here. Um, but but in some ways, um, while those discussions at committee are important, uh, the real thinking and needs to happen well in advance of that committee date. So I think it's important uh, to to try and we've been trying to 
uh, get information uh, out there. You'll find some things certainly on the Glebe uh, Community Association website. Uh, Councillor Menard, uh, because this is, I mean, this is a citywide project, but I think um, he is really taking a lead. I would say, having talked to many of the uh, city councillors, they're looking to him to sort of take the lead because it's in his ward. Uh, so he has actually set up a website called uh, betterlandsdown.ca, uh, and that's a great site. Um, he's identified a number of, uh, uh, of, of key issues, you know, the, the um, sacrifice of the green space, the, uh, the towers, the transportation issues, affordable housing, um, and then I think just the public improvements, the need for the focus on public improvements as well. There's a lot of information there on that site. So in terms of trying to educate yourself uh, about what the, what the details of the proposal, definitely encourage you to go there. And then um, whatever you think about the proposal, write your counselor. Um, and I think above all, no matter where you land on this issue and what you think, you know, yes, no, somewhere in between, yes to this, no to that, uh, I my I think the most important thing that I would ask of any counselor uh, would be to make sure that we have done that you've done your due diligence. Let's not get ourselves into another LRT situation. Um, in that situation, I think counselors, uh, as we saw, could uh, could somebody be be forgiven uh, because information was actually being withheld uh, from them and 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 in, 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 in impacting on crucial uh, decisions. But um, but but knowing that um, and certainly wanting to avoid that situation, I think it's really important that uh, that councillors, all councillors across the city, be urged to really pay attention, to really do their due diligence, have their staff do their due diligence, look to uh, experts in their communities, in fact, even to help out with that review of that due diligence, so that they can make the best decision possible uh, for for the city as a whole. Uh, I think that's that's the most important thing that we can ask uh, of our of our of our leaders uh, around the table at City Council. Absolutely, and I think it's safe to say that that committee meeting might be a long one because there's a few uh, community members who'll probably want to speak. And thanks so much for highlighting those websites. We'll put a link there for the Gleep Community Association and the fantastic website, the Better Lands Down website, so people can check that out. Well, Great. I want to thank you so much for your time, Carolyn. Um, thanks for all the hard work you're doing in the community. Obviously, some, some great stuff. I'm wondering, any last words for our Synapsity audience? Um, you know, I could just uh, encourage everyone to, I know everyone's so busy, um, and there's so many issues that can grab your attention, but, uh, but I, I do think community is really important. It's about where we live on a day-to-day -day basis. And while sometimes people say, oh, municipal politics and uh, they're not things that really impact me. I, I think things that happen uh, around and decisions that are made at city council uh, and within and that impact on, on communities are, are, um, are really important things to, to try and get involved in. So do what you can, where, where you can, when you can, but, but do try to, try to get involved and, and to, uh, to be part of that community engagement. Absolutely. Those are some great words. Uh, we definitely echo that at Synapsity. Once again, thank you so much for all your work and thanks for coming on Community Connections today. Well, thank you, Nick. I really appreciate your, your interest and uh, we'll, uh, we'll, I know we're all, we're all focused on uh, just working as positively as we can and trying to move, move, uh, move the needle forward. Yeah, it's going to be a busy fall. Thanks again. It sure is. Great. Thanks, Nick. Thank you for watching Community Connections brought to you by Synapse. Be sure to follow us on social media and subscribe to our YouTube channel for more content like this. Until next time, stay connected.